my great honour to introduce Uncle Dave Wandon today uh, for his presentation on myth number five, nature doesn't belong in the city. Uncle Dave Wandon is the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Elder and Cultural Practices Manager in Fire and Water at the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Cultural Heritage Aboriginal Corporation. He's also a recognised leader in the promotion and execution of cool or cultural burns in Victoria. So that connects in very well with Michael's uh, previous presentation. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Uncle Dave on Miss Five. You're lucky. I don't have a PowerPoint. I'm not going to rush you through. How I'm going to follow on from Sean, Michael, Fletcher, not speeding it up, but it's good. He's been listening to me. A lot of what he spoke about today is what we've been talking about over a few years. But my part of it is nature doesn't, doesn't belong in cities. I would have thought that that myth has already been dispelled with COVID. Didn't we all realise when we couldn't go outside how much we wanted to get into green spaces? I'm lucky I live in Hillsville. When they brought in the 5K limit, I measured out where I needed to go. It's 2.2 Ks to my farm, which is my conservation area, my agricultural area. I live on 90 hectares of bush block. Coles is 2.2 Ks away. If I want anything else from outside, I got it through the post office. I was lucky. But I heard everybody complaining when it was a 10k radius. Now it went to a 5k radius. It's a dictatorship. We're Australians. We've got the right to go where we want to go. And I thought, I hope that everybody learns. And I guess this is a good follow-up from what Sean Michael was talking about. But some of our ancestors, when they were taken off their lands and not allowed to go and check their green spaces, which was their cultural responsibility to check, collect data, analyse and manage country. Some of them were forced onto mission stations with maybe a five mile radius, were born there and died there without ever being allowed to go any further. We are lucky that we live in the luckiest country in the world and we don't have passport control between our states, but we did have passport control during COVID where we had to carry a permit. You're only allowed out during certain times to do your primary function of your economics. We actually found that during COVID you had more time to actually appreciate the green that we do have in our cities. Instead of working your 40 hour week, which you spend half the time commuting prior to COVID, and making sure you get a bit of overtime so you can grab your kids and drive as far away from the city as you can to go and see what? To go and see green. That's what everybody wanted. But during COVID, when you weren't allowed to do that, you actually discovered that usually for these people who do live in the city, call yourself Melburnians, but there's a creek not too far away from where you live and it's got heaps of green there. There's a little reserve next to a kindergarten maybe at the edge of the school that you never knew was there. So you didn't know that you didn't need green until you were told that you couldn't find it. So we do need green, but how much do we put in? We heard that in some of the conversations earlier. And whose job is it to put it there? Is it up to the ecologists, the botanists, to decide what green you should have? I like the colour chart of green. There are many styles of green. What makes you feel good? I know if you, t if you did a record or a census, and there was done a while ago, Melbourne City Council was looking for a Wurundjeri representative to sit on the council. 
And so they put out the call. We need someone who lives within a certain distance of this town hall to be a representative. And it went to Wurundjeri Tribe Land Council to ask the question. We couldn't find one person who lives within the Melbourne City District because we as Aboriginal people know the importance of green. It is out there in nature, but we are living in nature. We have imposed our cities on nature. And by placing green where you can within your cities, whether done by council, whether done by landscape architects, urban designers, town planners, Does that fulfil what we need as green? It doesn't. Every individual here... A bit closer. Jeez, I thought I had to move away from it. Yeah. Oh, take them away and I'll really talk. That's great. I'm not used to trying to talk so quietly. Yeah, yeah. That's OK. Now you made me lose my track of thought, but that's OK. But each person needs to choose their own green, not have it chosen for them. To declare your own little bit of country, whether it's your balcony on the 20th floor, whether it's your bathroom, which supposedly has some very powerful benefits of the right kind of plants in your bathroom. We spend too much time waiting for government and science to tell us what we should be doing. Because we're all too afraid to make decisions now because we have been brainwashed. That's my take, what I get from you, Sean. We've been brainwashed to think in a certain way. The government will make these decisions for you. It's for your benefit because we want you out there working, being more productive. And yet if you look at the Aboriginal way of life, where we worked within greens and reds and blues and browns, and greys and blacks. We only ever work four hours a day. Because if you have the right mixture of green, and when we talk about green plantings and green roofs and various varieties, when I walk out in the bush, and which is why I don't like to come into the city except to hopefully educate some people, and why we don't have Wurundjeri people living in the city, We keep thinking about, and what I've been hearing most of the day, even though we talk about biodiversity, it's about green for us. And that's fine as humans in the way that when I walk out into a forest or a grassland or a bush or a wetlands, I think of four things, what my ancestors would have done before colonisation, and I'm looking for food, I'm looking for fibre, I'm looking for tools, and I'm looking for medicine for me and my community. That's a great thing, humans looking after humans. But if you think about cultural responsibility, which everybody who calls Australia home should have some form of cultural re responsibility, when you're thinking about green and you're thinking about biodiversity and increasing biodiversity, so if you put the plants there, you put the nesting box out, I heard that's been spoken about today. So that's good while well, an animal or a bird is breeding. But what about the bedrooms that they need later on when the young one grows up? Where's the hotels that we're building from, just like we do for humans? The apartment houses, the bee hotels. So when we're thinking about what we're going to plant, and it's very, very structured in what I'm hearing from today, it's let's think about what does that animal or bird need? Not just its habitat, but what does it need for food, for fibre to make that habitat? The medicine for when an animal is pregnant, just like humans. And the tools that enable them to do that. I think then we'll get a much more brighter output on biodiversity and celebrate the green that we have, because it's not just there for the very young or for the very old. It respects all stages of all animals, insects, birds, reptiles, 
We don't think we've got reptiles in the city. Go for a walk in the parks at night, you'll find them. You make up your bed if you're going to park out there like a homeless person, you're still checking for snakes, they're out there. We just don't see them. Green is great, yeah. But think about, and the way that I get people to think about this when they're starting to plan in their job is think about our way of managing country was not just because of the knowledge that we held that was passed down to, it, to us through our ancestors, because it was also written down and it's written in all the various shades of green that we've got. It's just that modern science hasn't caught up with us on how to actually read that. Different colours are different indicators to us of managing country, just like different colours attract different pollinators. And that gets into ultraviolet spectrum, which we can't see. So we can choose greens because it's a pretty green, but it, it's not going to be any good if it doesn't give off that ultraviolet spectrum that attracts those pollinators. I don't think we've gone deep enough into the science as when we start to think about urban greening, the real depth of who we're doing it for, for our pleasantry and our surprise. We talk about biodiversity. We talk about biosecurity. I love talking about biosecurity in that last section. I've just recently been elected to Victoria's Agri Agri Agvic Biosecurity Council. And I had to remind them that biosecurity is biodiversity. The more diverse the system you've got, the more healthier the system it is. The more healthier it is, the more resilient it is to biosecurity. Instead of worrying about what's coming in, because I think we've got a very good job of managing of what's trying to come in now, it's about dealing with what we've got here at the moment. The inherent threats that we've got since colonisation that is actually affecting our green. And the more you take it out of the cities, when people then want to leave the city each weekend and come up to my place at Hillsville, where I can't get to Coles for 48 hours unless I'm out there at 8 o'clock in the morning, and then you've all got to rush back here into the grey and wait for that next opportunity to come out into the green. So the myth about we don't need green in the city, and that's, I'm not talking about green paint, yes, we need our green. We know it's cooling effects. We know it's insulating properties. Subdued green nighttime lights. There's a whole study done about uh, night, light flooding of nighttime and the, the way it affects the breeding cycles of particularly our smaller gliders, our bats, that really breaks up that system, which breaks down their individual biodiversity. And the way that we did that is by every Aboriginal person was given a totem that connects them to country. So my totem is the ringtailed possum, and it wasn't given to me at birth, like you see in the American movies, you know, where the Indian chief is standing outside, and uh, you know, here's a baby cry, and the first animal that he sees, well, that's you know, that's who that person is. And if he sees two bears doing their business in the wood, then that's the name of the, then that's the name of that person. That's two bears effing for the rest of his life. That's not the way it was done here. It was done by observation. It was done by science. We are the first scientists of this country. Modern science, and I'm glad we've got Aboriginal people working in that to actually show you're not inventing or discovering anything new. It was already there. I've, talked, I've spoken to geologists who have said, I studied the Yarra River and I can tell you geologically how it was formed. I said, how long did you study that for? He said, oh, 25 years. I said, geez, if you had met my dad, my dad five years ago, he could have told you the whole story in five minutes. But you wouldn't have believed him because it's not written down. But I told him the story about our creation of the Yarra. And he goes, you know what, that is so close to the scientific version of how the Yarra was formed. He must have been a scientist. I said, no, he was a leather worker. But anyway, he had his own totem. My kids have their own totems. But the way that we connect to country is not by planting more plants, although that is a great social enterprise, it's a great thing for everybody to want to do, but it's about what you're planting for aside from yourself and the protection of the human race. So me as the ringtail possum, I was given that name because they are my community observed what I like to do as I started to crawl around and climb and walk and talk. Now, I love to climb trees, but I wasn't the koala that, you know, sat there in the fork of the tree once I got up there. 
No, I was the one that had to go out on the limbs as far as out as I could until they started moving under my weight and then hang upside down from the back of my knees, just like the ringtail uses its tail to hang upside down from those very small branches. So when I go out in the bush and I'm looking for my food, fibre, tools and medicine, I'm also looking for my totem. And if I see a tree, oh yes, that's good habitat for the possum. Then I start looking, has it got water to drink? Has it got the tools it needs to build its nest? Has it got the food that it needs? Is the medicine there if it gets sick? And so I build up an ecological system, which when I meet someone else from another mob and I say, who's your mob? And they say, yes, I'm from this mob. And I say, who's your totem? And they have their collective ecological knowledge. And this is how we exchange knowledge rather than having conferences like this. We do this just in casual conversation. It's a part of who we are, that we become a part of nature. It's not our job to influence, it's to work with it for the benefit of ourselves, yes, but also for the benefit of everything else that lives within it. And whether that is green or red or blue or grey or black or white, every person can connect to their one particular totem and understand how that interacts with another species which needs another plant. And this is how you build up your knowledge of biodiversity so that you know what you're actually protecting and what you're protecting it for long past your lifetime. We're protecting it for the children that are not yet born. We're protecting it for the species that have not yet been discovered by science. Once it is discovered, There'll be some mob out there say, oh, geez, you could have come and told us. Yeah, we remember that one. We found that one 4,000 years ago. All the knowledge is out there, but it's how we connect to the country, connect to that green. And it doesn't mean you have to be an Aboriginal to have a totem. There are many people that are probably members of friends groups and they're there because of a threatened species and that's their focus and that's a great thing. But what about the ones that aren't threatened yet? If we ignore them and what they need and the biodiversity that they need, they will become threatened. So yes, we need green in our cities, we need green in our forests, but we need more green in our cities because this is going to be where we're going to be trapped because of climate change, because it'll be too hot to walk outside, it'll be too flooded to walk outside, it'll be too burning to be walking outside your cities. So yes, Let's get green back into the city and respect what green actually does for us in nature, for our health and our well-being. Thank you very much. Thanks, Uncle Dave. That was amazing. Uh, we've got one question on the app. Thing, but does anyone have a question they'd like to ask with a microphone? They're all a bit shy. See how good I did? I answered <laughs> all their questions. <laughs> all right, so I'll um, go to the, the question online is about where are some great resources about plants? Uh, that we could engage with uh, plants that particularly support uh, other species. Uh, I think there might be a book over here on this table. Uh, but Dave, I'm sure you know of others too. I started off my work in land management or conservation and land management. And I discovered a Bible written by Beth Gott the first ethnobotanist, I believe, in it, the first woman ethnobotanist in Australia who studied the foods and plants of Aboriginal people of southeastern Australia. And I use that as the beginning of strengthening my cultural knowledge to then go out into that wider sphere of understanding what other plants and animals needed. So companion plants is also a very important part of the system, which is quite often ignored. Yes, we talked about monocultures, and sometimes that's necessary for a food, from our food perspective, but we can't live just on bread alone, as it said. We all try and live on McDonald's. We know that doesn't work. I remember during COVID, I couldn't get to McDonald's. 
there's no McDonald's in Hillsville. And I couldn't wait to get back. So three years without McDonald's, I was going to get one of those. You know what? It's true. It does sit in your stomach like a brick and doesn't dissolve for about four days. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's where I started with Beth Scott's book. She's now passed away. Um, but any time I'm in doubt, I go back to that. I start off with our foods, which are a part of the biodiverse system that we've got, and they will be a part of the future if climate change does do what it does. Um, and from there you can start to expand by working what is not necessarily food for us, but what makes those plants grow better that are more productive. So we get away from that monoculture because then we're starting to use, as we used our totems, to do a lot of our farming for us that encourages those bees to come and do the pollinating, encourages what we used to have, which are now mostly extinct, is our small animals, which be attracted because it was food for them, who would do half the gardening and the weeding for us. Um, it's about planting the plants there. In some cases, it sounds really radical, but using a wombat as a weed machine by planting the right plants that it's likes. So if you think about the use of fire when, you, when we're talking about indigenous plants, fire was a farming tool as a part of agriculture not to remove pests, but to create healthy pastures that would bring our animals in so that when they came in and they were calm, which was when you killed them, that you'll actually get the best flavour and the best nutrition of meat. Anybody, and there probably wouldn't be many hunters in here. Yeah, <laughs> oh, hello, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. looking for what we can't see. Absolutely, obviously. yes. And that's what I do when I take people for walks and I say, look, and I, and I usually start off with the question, you're all looking at all this beautiful green and usually I'm looking at something that's beautifully sick but the structure is not there anymore in our trees. We yeah. value our red gums but they're not red gums anymore. They're a different species from what they were 200 years ago as many of our plants are. They're already adapting right before your eyes and we can't see them. We can't see that trees are walking down hillsides because we're not looking at a place long enough. So my question was... Yeah, go on. Is there anywhere within, you know, a two-hour drive of our urban footpaths that is a good example that you know, we can, where we can walk and mm. see something that's actually working to help our eyes? Yeah. No, there's not. <laughs> there's the honest answer. There is not. In the Victorian landscape in particular because of the gold rush, our whole Victorian landscape is absolute... There, there is very, if there's any, I don't know about them, that is actually a remnant of what it was like at the time of colonisation. Ah, so you've got to learn to look for indicators of remnants within a remnant or what is declared as a remnant. Now, how do you learn that? You can start off doing a conservation management course, a basic introduction, and then you can start to gather your own data. You can use, and we started the day off talking about the value of citizen science to inform what science actually then goes out and asks itself of what it's trying to prove. So if you find something that you don't know, then pass it on to someone who you think that will. And this is the, this is the role of councils and government, to actually connect rather than keep us disconnected from science, that you have to be a doctor to know everything. You can be the person on the street that can ask the question or should be able to ask the question of your scientists and your universities and your council employees and your environmentalists who work within those government departments. That is their actual job. And most people are too scared to make the phone call and say, I think I've found something new. They're embarrassed to be so, oh, no, we know all about that. Because someday, one day, you might just find something new because we are discovering new things all the time or we're rediscovering something that is thought to be extinct because someone has taken, and it usually comes from citizen science, and that actually costs nothing. 
when someone goes out there to find a threatened species of a plant, an animal, a fish, a bird, whatever, um, it's a lot of money to go out there and do those surveys. And I value the work that the universities do for that, but it is quite often the citizen that leads the scientists to start looking in that area in the first place. So indicators, I know my indicators by talking to my mobs, not, not the universities. And each particular landscape that I walk through will give me different indicators on what the health is and what I should expect to find. And that's why I start off the indicators are food, fibre, medicine, tools. And then I can start to expand on what's actually in there and whether it's actually good and healthy or not. If there's not enough there to support me, there's usually not enough there to support the animals and birds that actually live in there 24 hours a day. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you very much, Uncle Dave, for an amazing presentation. And please take a seat for the panel discussion. I'd like to invite our other panellists now. Uh, we have Dr Vicky Martin, who's a senior consultant from Mosaic Insights. Professor Wendy Steele from the Centre for Urban Research at RMIT University. And Dr Dimity Williams, who's a GP, author, and she's not here. So, unfortunately, <laughs> we don't have Dr Dimity Williams. But we have Vicky and Wendy and Dave. So, does everyone have a microphone? Hello. So I might go to Vicky first. Um, would you like to just uh, respond to Uncle Dave's words? Uh, what do you think? Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Uncle Dave. That was a very moving um, talk and I wish that all Australians could, could hear more. I look forward to the day where, where everybody is aware of uh, you know, ind Indigenous perspectives. Um, so I have to admit I'm an environmental social scientist. Um, there's a few of us in the room, but we are a bit of a rare breed. So my perspective comes from people um, and in these landscapes. Um, if you notice my shirt, there's sea creatures on here, and that's to remind me to remind you that we're also talking about blue spaces. So. You know, we are a marine nation, More than, nearly 90% of our population lives within 50 kilometres of the coastline. A lot of our cities and our urban spaces are coastal. So blue spaces pl play a really important role in community wellbeing, individuals' wellbeing. Um, Dave invited us to think about our special green space. Well, certainly my special blue, uh, space is blue, yeah. Um, and and that, that's the case for a lot of Australians. Um, we do know from a lot of social research, and I'm talking about decades of research, not just recently, um, that people do care very deeply about the environment. And we often see from government agencies uh, a bit of an us and them attitude that, you know, I, I've had uh, marine park staff say to me, we just need to get the public to care about the blue space as much as we do. But we know from multiple surveys that, um, and interviews with people that they do care. They do care very deeply. But they are often waiting to be told because they don't know what to do. So that's something that we can certainly help with. We know too that biodiversity plays an incredibly important role in people's lives, not just for their enjoyment of our green and blue spaces, um, not just for their mental health and their physical health, but for all the other ecosystem services that we've heard a bit about today. Um, but we see too in, in social research that biodiversity is actually a preferred state um, you know, there's lots of landscape planning research um, that shows this, that people prefer diverse environments to sit in and feel great in, um, as opposed to those monocultures. But even in our own research on citizen science, we're seeing that people who um, experience more di um, diversity in the species that they're recording are more likely to come back and keep participating in those citizen science programs. Um, yeah, so finally, I'd like to see also um, some greater integration of some of these different disciplines. 
um, social science, of course, in um, a lot of the environmental planning and decision making that we do. That's something that we are trying to do um, a great job of at Mosaic. Um, because a lot of our um, interdisciplinary teams can come up with much better solutions when we understand um, the public, who we're trying to work with, what it is we're trying to achieve, how best to communicate with them. We've got decades and decades and decades of research on human behaviour, effective communication. Um, so I'd certainly encourage any of you working in that space with communities to come and talk to social scientists to, to get a hand with some of that. So there's some of my reflections and I yeah, really appreciate um, hearing from you today. Thanks, Thanks for that. There's a whole lot of points you just raised. So when you announced what I have done or what I'm currently doing at the moment, I did spend a lot of time working with uh, mental health experts and the, the understanding um, when we talk about biodiversity and I forget about our marine as in our coastal species because as a Wurundjeri person, uh, I consider my freshwater uh, people. So I do think about our rivers and streams and being close to them and seeing them healthy makes us as Aboriginal people feel healthy. So I do sit on the Burrung Council. But prior to that, I was working with mental health, particularly for Aboriginal people. And I found that connecting my community as I learnt what I was, uh, as I built my knowledge uh, from an Indigenous land management perspective or Aboriginal land management perspective and bringing our young people on board who were some of them are struggling with mental health issues. And of course, the answer to most things is yes, you need this amount of medication that many times a day and see this many psychologists. By actually getting them out on country and getting them to differentiate and learn the difference between green and green and green and green and green. Because when you're standing back, it all looks green. But when you get them down close and get them to start to look at the slight variations, that they actually start to improve their own mental health. And many of those people have now got full-time work, are raising families, and my youngest son is one of those, actually. He looked like he wasn't going to do anything with his life. Now he's also another fire elder, uh, because once he understood his roles and responsibilities more than just the personal satisfaction that, that because we pay taxes that we think we're entitled to. So the social aspect very often outweighs the economic cost of actually preserving our environment, whether that be marine or terrestrial. Terrestrial is the word I meant to say, so thank you. So, um, Wendy, I'd like to hear your reflections on Uncle Dave's presentation and the conversation subsequent. Thanks very much and um, thank you very much, Uncle Dave. Um, it's a, you know, a great privilege to be on Wurundjeri land and to be you know, have the privilege of hearing these stories and I agree with Dave that, you know, we don't often get a chance to hear them uh, in this very personal way, so thank you for that. Um, what I've been hearing today is about this shared um, human habitat uh, and the different forms that this can take. So there's not one vision of a human habitat. Um, there are so many and yet the city dominates in so many ways our imaginary of, of what of what that could be. Um, and, and in Australia, the moment of the city, and it, it is just that, it's, it's a moment in um, millennia, um, the moment of the city ha has taken on such a particular reflection of the dominant values that have underpinned that. Um, the moment of the city in Australia is on unceded Aboriginal land. Um, it has had a very particular kind of morphology um, and development-led ethos. It's um, very much grounded in private property rights, for example. Um, and I think in the 21st century, we've, we've landed in a, a shared space that recognises very much that this is no longer sustainable and that we have to do things differently. Mm. And yet we're at a kind of, you know, a, a crossroads that can be both positive and very challenging in terms of just what that future shared pathway can be. Because we can't, much as we might like to go back, um, we can't stay where we are. Um, and what we do need to do is find ways towards, you know, what many of us might refer to as regenerative futures, um, more sustainable futures, transformative futures that are different to where we are now in this climate crisis. 
Um, so I think the, the future for me is, is urban. Um, Urbanisation, unfortunately, transects our whole planet. We are looking at planetary scale urban challenges. But the question for all of us as a shared journey is will these futures be equitable? Will they be green? Will they be um, gently interconnected with biodiversity and um, concern and care for other species in the way that we just heard so beautifully expressed? The these are still big question marks. Um, I, I guess just the lessons hopefully we've learned from the juggernaut of, you know, um, the great acceleration from industrialization through to, you know, the sort of accelerated progress was that we, you know, we were very good in the West at developing technologies and um, being almost singularly focused on, you know, on, on progress. But what we weren't so good at was carefully connecting back to country, reflecting on whether that progress was needed, was ethical, was useful. Uh, these, these reflective skills are ones that I think we're, we're all having to rebuild, or many of us anyway, certainly, um, uh, certainly myself. Um, and the danger, I think, is that we, we kind of juggernaut into a techno-green, eco-modernist perspective in the same way without reflecting, thinking, connecting, learning, listening, so that we don't just repeat um, under a different, you know, maybe soft green guise, uh, some of the mistakes that we made in the 20th century. Um, so I'll just leave it there, but thank you so much to both of you for your comments. Uh, thank you for that. You, you've also just reminded me of a couple of... So you said that we can't go backwards. And it's true, we can't go back to what, what was. But we can go back and learn where the mistakes were made. Um, and I did hear in this morning's session of some of the speakers actually admitting that the, the ethos that they worked under, that they fully believed in, was wrong. And I think that's the first thing. It's starting to not only admitting your mistakes, but learning from them as you uh, may make new ones. But don't discard the ancient wisdom, most people would call it, or the knowledge systems of my ancestors who have gone through this data analysis for more than 65,000 years. And although uh, from Sean Michael's charts, they were, they were fairly an even flow with not too much ups and downs, I'll guarantee you we made mistakes, but we learnt from them and we moved forward and we remembered that we made mistakes. And that was what was in our collective memory. And when you look at the ancient red gum trees that are 800, 900 years old, you don't have to cut them down and read the rings, but you can read it in the trees and in, in the leaves and the shapes of the branches and the, and the animals that are living in it, the animals and the birds and the insects, that all the information that we need for science is back there. It's how we transfer it into the new combination of both knowledge systems. And the way that I philosophise about doing that is about we've got to learn to walk country together, to heal country together. And as we heal country together, we start to heal ourselves with people. And country, in a modern concept, is green. Thank you. Thank you. And blue. And blue. And blue. So we have a few minutes if there are any more questions from the audience for any of our panellists. We've got one here, if someone's got a mic. I just wanted to know um, what you farm and how you manage your patch of paradise. Yeah, so it's an experiment. It's only 200 acres and it's what remains of what was Corrindeck Mission Station, where my ancestors eventually chose to live. So the first land rights claim in Australia back in 1863, uh, which many people don't know about. Um, it always had cattle on it. And when we got this 200 acres back in 1998, we left the cattle on there with a, shall I say, a mediocre register who didn't actually manage the land he used the land purely for the purposes of how many head he could fatten up. You know, drop off 100 cows, all in calf. A year later, take 200 cows off and do the same again. And he was absolutely exhausting the land. 
and um, it made me a little bit disappointed. So through my land management um, reinvigoration, cultural knowledge, I guess, I started to look at that land along with modern science and reclass the land and show how we could make that still a productive farm economically, uh, but also by returning um, at least 30% of it back to conservation biodiversity values, that we could actually improve our pastures and improve our cattle. So we have less cattle, but we have less overheads in managing them and we get a higher price at market for them because of the quality. So we've lost nothing economically wise, but we've gained a whole heap in the way of healing country. Because once, as we, as we are healing country, and we're using it as a demonstration, particularly for school groups to come out and see what sustainable regenerative agriculture alongside conservation, how it can actually work and be a benefit as we move forward into the future. Because those, yes, we hear about we shouldn't have more trees, and it's true, it's about getting the balance of trees, grasses, shrubs, you're getting all those layers right. But as everybody else's pastures around us that aren't doing that work, and our next door neighbour has already said, he's actually asking a couple of times now, can I put some of my cattle on your land because I've exhausted my pastures because he hasn't done the same thing that we did. So it's a demonstration of giving Aboriginal person land, as William Barrack said in 1881 when he was trying to hang on to Corrindirk, give us this land and we will show you how to work it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm not creating paradise for myself. I'm creating an example for a lot of people in this room, but particularly our younger generation who will take over these roles, that there is a different way and I don't need science to do it. Thanks. Uh, time for one last question. Near the pillar. Thank you. Uh, it's not really a question, but uh, I'd just like to get your foot, David, and, and bouncing on, uh, on Wendy's point around technology. And it reminds me of a, of a great quote that I've heard, that when you look back through history, any civilization that has focused too much on technology to get ahead and has left wisdom behind has eventually gone instinct. And, and to me, that brings in the question of an of a ego as well in the conversation. And I just wanted to, yeah, to get your thoughts on that. On, um... well, I remember in the early days when I first started to learn to public speak, I said, we're like death and taxes, us Aboriginals. We're not going away because our knowledge is still applicable today. But yes, we learned from that. We are the oldest living culture on earth uh, because we never overutilised our resources. We learned to work within what nature and the land told us that we could take. And that's through a whole philosophy and they say that we were uh, you know, not very technological, but if you think about Aboriginal people, who, who were the first people who invented flight? It was us who invented the boomerang. It didn't need a human behind it, steering it, but we learned to throw a stick to come back to exactly where you wanted it. So we were technically advanced long before Orville Wright, um, but that's why we survived, because we have paid respect to the country that was given to us by our creator spirit, um, and I don't care what religion you're from, I think they're all the same and we all should learn from them because it sustains human life. So our creator spirit is Bunjil and he says, I don't give you this land to own that you can trade, that you can sell off, you can destroy, you can exhaust. I give this land to you to be custodians of for the future generations. And I think that's where a lot of our other races eventually, and that's the way the modern world lives. I'm only in here for the next generation because after that I'm going to be dead and I don't care. Whereas we live not only for a thousand years backwards, we live for a thousand years forwards, at a minimum in the philosophy of how we should be managing this country. Right, well, that's a fabulous place to leave our conversation. Thank you all. <laughs>